footage of colonial Spanish soldiers firing cannons and musket overlaid with a moving map of the Castillo de San Marcos. Castillo de San Marcos, a long legacy, an effective defense. A 17th century map of Mexico, the Caribbean, and the Florida Territory. As the 1600s drew to a close, the Atlantic and Gulf coasts of North America teemed with activity. First the Spanish, then the British, and the French explored and set up colonies. Spanish territory consisted of the areas surrounding the Gulf of Mexico, Florida, Mexico, Central America, Northern South America, and much of the Caribbean. British territory consisted of the east coast of the United States down to Georgia and what is now Jamaica. The French later claimed much of the interior of the United States and along the Mississippi down to Louisiana, as well as Haiti. From Canada to Cuba, European military engineers built fortifications to protect their outposts of empire. In St. Augustine, the Spanish government authorized a costly stone fortification they called Castillo de San Marcos to safeguard their northernmost colony, La Florida. Construction began in 1672 and was completed 23 years later in 1695. A painting showing the Castillo's construction, the exterior of the Castillo today. With 33-foot high walls that were at least 17 feet thick and powerful artillery, the Castillo provided a daunting defense and decades of security for St. Augustine and its harbor. For Spain's citizens living in the area, it stood as a citadel, a refuge where they and the Spanish soldiers sheltered themselves during sieges that lasted as long as two months. Siege warfare was a waiting game. Defenders of the Castillo took calculated risks by deciding how to carefully ration food, supplies, and ammunition until hoped for reinforcements arrived from Cuba or Mexico. The attackers, on the other hand, hoped that they had adequate amounts of food, supplies, and powerful enough artillery to breach the walls of the fortress. Illustrations of the Siege of St. Augustine. But the designers and builders of the Castillo did their jobs well. Despite attacks and lengthy sieges, no enemy ever took it by force. Each time the Castillo changed hands, it came about by treaty and negotiation, not combat the Spanish Cross of Burgundy, the British and the United States flags. Three main factors account for the long legacy of the Castillo's effective defense, its structure and design, the soldiers who manned the fort, and the firearms and artillery they were trained to use. The design of the Castillo took into account very defensive thinking for the time. From above, the design of the Spanish fortress resembles a star with four large points. A 3D model of the Castillo shows the fort's star-like shape and placement of cannons, then zooms in on the northeast corner. Each corner is protected by a broad, diamond-shaped bastion. The dozens of cannon mounted on these bastions covered the approaches to the fort with deadly, interlocking fields of fire. On the flat Florida coast, the Castillo's 30-foot-high walls allowed sentries to see an enemy approaching with plenty of time to ready the defenses. A Spanish sentry uses a long spyglass to scan the surrounding area. The walls were made of thick coquina, a soft limestone formed out of shells and sand. Coquina was surprisingly effective at absorbing the impact of enemy shot without cracking or shattering the way harder stones would. Since no fortress can function without a trained and disciplined garrison, the second factor of the Castillo's effective defense was the soldiers. Regimented drilling allowed combat procedures to become second nature to these soldiers, a critical component in the heat of battle. The men drilled constantly to master the use of two key gunpowder weapons integral to the defense of the Castillo, the cannon and the musket. Spanish soldiers load and fire cannons and muskets. These weapons were the third piece of the Castillo's defense. Bronze and cast iron cannon were the most powerful and longest range weapons in Castillo de San Marcos. With big guns of varying sizes, cannon worked together as a system to provide what is known as interlocking fields of fire. 
a 3D illustration of the Castillo demonstrates its interlocking fields of fire. Artillery was placed to cover all of the angles an enemy might approach. If any one cannon failed, there were others covering the same ground. A cannon crew made up of at least four soldiers and a commander learned to clean, load, and fire their gun by drill commands. It was important not to forget one step when under attack, making the hours of practice all the more critical. First, the gun captain calls the crew to attention. Attention! Before loading, a cannoneer cleans out and moistens the bore to put out any sparks left in the barrel from earlier firings. Gunners then load powder and ball and lever the heavy weapon into its firing position. Then they aim and prime the vent with loose gunpowder. A cross-section illustration of the inside workings of a cannon. Looking inside the barrel, we see the gunpowder-filled cartridge and cannonball immediately below the primed vent. When the priming powder is lit, the gunpowder quickly burns down to the cartridge, igniting it. The resulting explosion forces the cannonball out of the barrel faster than the speed of sound. After the shot, the artillerymen check the bore before repeating the cycle. The Castillo's smoothbore cannon could be loaded with a variety of deadly projectiles. A single solid cannonball was the best choice for battering holes in large targets at maximum range. The biggest guns at Castillo de San Marcos had a range of three miles, while the smaller six-pounder cannon had a range of a mile and a half. Even when facing enemy attack, Spanish soldiers methodically followed each of the commands to load and fire the cannon. The cannon drill. Regular practice of the cannon drill was required so that they would not overlook a single step when in the heat of battle. Following is an example of this drill. The drill commander gives instructions in Spanish. Atención. Dispónganse para el ejercicio. Attention. Prepare for the drill. The men stand in position on both sides of the cannon. Bendíganos Santa Barbara. Bless us, Saint Barbara. The soldiers make the sign of the cross. Entren la cuchara en el cañón. Bring up the ladle. A soldier steps out of formation, picks up the ladle, holds it overhead, brings it to the front of the cannon, and stuffs it down the barrel. Reconozcan si está cargado. Check the gun is clear. A second soldier drops a pin into the vent on the back of the cannon, lifting and dropping it repeatedly. Retiren la cuchara. Lay aside the ladle. The soldier in the front of the cannon removes the ladle, lifts it overhead, and places it back on the rack. Entre la nanada y tapen el fogón. Pasen la nanada en el cañón. Bring sponge and tend vent. Sponge gun. A third soldier picks up the sponge on a stick from a rack. Another soldier plugs the vent as the barrel is sponged. Retírenla a su lugar. Apronten atacador y pólvora. Lay aside the sponge. Bring rammer and powder. The soldier places the sponge back on the rack and picks up the rammer. Another soldier brings the powder. Entrenla en el cañón. Ataquen. Load the powder. Ram down the charge. The rammer pushes the charge down the barrel. A soldier plugs the vent hole while another nudges him aside to drop the pin into the vent hole again. Atacador. A su lugar. Lay aside the rammer. The soldier lays the rammer back on the rack. Tomen los espeques. Dispóngase a poner en batería el cañón. Cañón en batería. Take up hand spikes. Prepare to move gun. Push gun into battery. Two soldiers stand next to the cannon with hand spikes, long wooden boards. With the hand spikes wedged against the bottom of the cannon, the soldiers use the hand spikes to move the cannon to the edge of the fort's wall. Dispónganse para la puntería. Apunten. Prepare to aim. 
Aim. A circle on the top of the vent pin is used to aim the cannon. The drill commander removes his hat, peers through the pin's circle, and instructs the soldiers with hand spikes to readjust. He steps back and holds a protractor-like tool to the end of the cannon's barrel. When held at the same level, a weight on the protractor gives the cannon's angle. The cannon is too low, so a soldier lifts the back of the barrel with his hand spike, while another adjusts a large wooden block under the back of the barrel. Especies, a su lugar. Lay aside hand spikes. The soldiers place the hand spikes on the sides of the cannon. Seven, y cubran el fogón. Prime and cover the vent. The vent pin is removed. A soldier pours gunpowder into the vent. Another soldier blocks the wind with his hat. The hat is held over the vent hole until the cannon is lit. Tomen el botafuego. Botafuego. Al cañón. Take up linstock. Position the linstock. A soldier picks up the linstock on a stick that is used to light the gunpowder. Alto y sople la mecha. Halt. Blow on the match. The soldier blows on the end of the linstock. Fuego. Fire. The soldier moves his hat away from the vent hole. The soldiers cover their ears. The linstock is held over the cannon's vent hole and the cannon fires. Botafuego a su lugar. Tomen las prolongas. Dispónganse a sacar el cañón de la batería. Lay aside linstock. Take up the prolongs. Prepare to bring the gun out of battery. Ropes are attached to the sides of the cannon. Cureña, fuera de batería. Alto. Prolongas a su lugar. Bring gun out of battery. Halt. Lay aside the prolongs. The soldiers pull the ropes to roll the cannon away from the wall. The ropes are removed and laid aside. Entren el sacatrapos en el cañón. Pasen el sacatrapos al cañón. Bring up the worm. Worm the gun. The worm, a spiral metal piece on the end of a stick, is picked up from the rack, inserted down the barrel of the cannon, and the soldier turns the stick counterclockwise. Retírenla a su lugar. Entren la nanada y tapen el fogón. Lay aside the worm. Bring sponge and tend vent. The soldier removes the worm and places it back on the rack. Another soldier picks up the sponge on a pole, dips it in a bucket of water, and wipes the top of the vent hole. Another soldier holds his thumb to the hole. Pasen la nanada al cañón. Sponge gun. The sponge is stuffed down the barrel of the cannon and turned. Retírenla a su lugar. Reáganse. Lay aside the sponge. Take your ease. The soldier removes the sponge and places it back on the rack. The soldiers have completed the drill. When engaging an enemy at closer range, soldiers relied upon a more portable weapon, the smoothbore flintlock musket. By the early 1700s, soldiers of every army in Europe were equipped with smoothbore flintlock muskets. Not as accurate as a rifle, yet much faster to reload, soldiers loaded and fired their flintlock muskets in unison, throwing a blast of bullets toward the enemy. At short ranges, the impact of a musket volley was psychologically devastating and deadly. As with the cannon, soldiers learned to handle their muskets by drilling. A sergeant gave orders that broke down the steps to load and fire into simple movements. Soldiers drilled so that they could make the movements without thinking about them and without forgetting a critical step, especially when in the heat of battle. First, a paper cartridge was torn open and a small amount of gunpowder was poured into the pan on the side of the flintlock. The soldier then inserted the cartridge into the barrel and rammed it down. To make ready to fire, he then pulled back the cock into the full cock position. A 3D model of the flintlock musket shows a cross-section of the firing mechanisms. The firing mechanism, or lock, of the flintlock musket was a strong, simple, and reliable design. Looking inside the lock mechanism, we find only a few basic moving parts. 
The trigger, cock, and flint are labeled on the outside of the gun. The inside contains a revolving piece labeled tumbler. When a soldier pulled the trigger, he released the tumbler inside of the lock mechanism. This allowed the cock, holding a sharpened flint, to fall forward and strike the hammer, creating a shower of sparks, which ignited the gunpowder in the pan. This powder flashed and set off the cartridge's powder inside the barrel, forcing the musket ball out. Well-trained soldiers could load and shoot their muskets as many as four times a minute, much faster than any rifleman of the same era. Like the cannon crew, Spanish soldiers were required to follow a specific drill of commands to load and fire their weapons during an enemy engagement. Constant practice and drilling allowed them to face battle and not overlook any of the commands. Following is an example of this drill. The musket drill. The drill commander gives instructions in Spanish. Four soldiers line up with their weapons. Armas al hombro. Shoulder arms. The soldiers rest the firing mechanisms of their muskets on their left shoulders with the barrel pointing into the air and hold the stock with their left hand. La mano derecha al arma. Retiren las armas. Right hand to the weapon. Recover. The soldiers place their right hands on the musket, turn their bodies 90 degrees, holding their muskets in front of them with two hands. Ponga la llave en el fiador. Limpien la piedra. Soplen la cazoleta. Half cock. Clean the flint. Blow out the pan. A leather cover on the hammer is removed. The flint piece on the cock is wiped clean. The soldiers blow on the pan to remove excess gunpowder. Saquen el cartucho. Abram el cartucho. Seven. Withdraw the cartridge. Open the cartridge. Prime. Each soldier removes a paper cartridge containing the gunpowder from a leather pouch on his waist. They bite and rip open the cartridge and pour some gunpowder into the pan. Cierren la cazoleta. Pasen las armas al lado izquierdo. Metan el cartucho en el cañón. Close the pan. Weapon to the left side. Put cartridge in the barrel. They close the pan, lower the musket to their side with the barrel pointing up and the stock on the ground, and pour the gunpowder from the cartridge down the barrel. Saquen la baqueta. Alta la baqueta. Acorten la baqueta. Metan la baqueta en el cañón. Ataquen. Withdraw the rammer, raise the rammer, shorten the rammer, put rammer in the barrel, ram down the cartridge. The rammer is attached along the bottom of the weapon's barrel. They pull the rammer out, hold it vertically in front of them, and stuff it down the barrel. Retiren la baqueta. Alta la baqueta. Acorten la baqueta. Metan la baqueta en su lugar. Armas al hombro. Recover the rammer, raise the rammer, shorten the rammer, put the rammer back, shoulder arms. The rammer is removed from the barrel, reattached under the barrel, and the musket is once again held upright to the shoulder. La mano derecha al arma. Altas las armas. Presenten las armas. Right hand to the weapon. Raise the weapon. Present the weapon. Each soldier holds their weapon vertically in front of them with their right hand. They turn their heads and point their weapons to the front, holding them horizontally with both hands, ready to fire. Preparen las armas. Apunten. Disparen. Cock the weapon. Take aim. Fire. The soldiers cock the flint back, hold the stock to their shoulder, aim the weapon, and fire. Retiren las armas. Armas al hombro. La mano derecha al arma. Reáganse. The weapon is lowered from its firing position, held to their shoulders, and the stock is lowered to the ground on their right side. The presence of this large stone fortress symbolized both permanence and security for Spain's Florida. The fortress itself, made of thick coquina walls that could absorb enemy fire, 
the soldiers who drilled repeatedly so that their skills became second nature. And the devastating weapons of that era were the key factors of Castillo de San Marcos's successful defense. All told, it was a big investment of time and treasure, but one that delivered safety and security to St. Augustine for decades to come. Castillo de San Marcos. A long legacy and effective defense. An Aperture Films Limited production. Produced by Christopher Blum and Joshua Culliver. Narrated by Travis Lawrence Johnson. Voice of Commander, Pablo Plumi. Production Team, Steve Gonski, Jack Tankard, Max Well. Post-Production Team, Christopher Karras, Michael DeLeon, Jeremy Floyd. Early St. Augustine Portraits by Bill Salander. Courtesy of the Florida Museum of Natural History, Historical Archaeology Collections. Special thanks to Charles Tingley of the St. Augustine Historical Society. Castillo de San Marcos National Monument. Joe Brem, Historic Weapons Program Manager. Luis Gonzalez, Site Supervisor. Gordy Wilson, Superintendent. Special thanks to the reenactors. Julius H. Single, Alex V. Dangnillo, Jr. Jeffrey S. Edel, Gordon Horn. John Cipriani, Richard Davis, Richard Harris Jr., Jeffrey Jones, Larry T. Metcalf, National Park Service, Harper's Ferry Center, Michelle Hartley, AV Producer, Mark W. Johnson, Translation and Creative Consultant, Magli Moras Green, Translation Consultant, Winnie Frost, Project Manager, Bob Cody, Contracting Officer. Many thanks to the staff and volunteers at Castillo de San Marcos National Monument for their assistance on this project. Presented by U.S. Department of the Interior, National Park Service logo, all rights reserved.